we're going to have remedial church starting today, uh, based on the results of our quizzes here today. <laughs> All of us will be participating. <laughs> Good morning, church. How's everyone this morning? For these of, <laughs> those of you who are joining us on. <clears throat> For those of you joining us on this morning, we have fun here. Come and join us. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made us rejoice and be glad. And we're definitely, you know, we got that last part down pretty good. We're, we're glad in it today. So we're having a good time. So a very good morning to you. Um, this morning I, I took the time and, and, and uh, uh, we watched David Jeremiah this morning. And he was talking about the millennial period. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about it from a perspective that I really hadn't heard. Mm -hmm. But he said, understand that we're only seven years away. Any day of our lives, we're only seven years away from that millennial period that God is talking about in there. And, and that Jesus told us on when we prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The kingdom time, that, that thousand years, that millennial period comes after seven years of tribulation, which follows the rapture. And I never thought about it, that the rapture could come any day. So that means we only have seven years of waiting to get to that period of time to where there's no more death, no more sickness, mm -hmm. nothing. In a hundred years, you will be called like a child. Isn't that amazing? Talk about a message of hope in a dark world. That's exactly what we need to hear. So I thought it was awesome uh, that message had to get. He's got a whole new study coming out um, October 1st, and I think that we're going to go ahead and get that. So if we want to have it here and, and we can go through it, I think it would be an awesome, awesome time because everything I've heard so far has been just fantastic. Feeds me, and I said, that's, that's great. I need to be fed too. Anyway, getting on with some things here. Go on the, um, at Gray Street Church. Some people call it announcements. It's going on. That's what's going to be today. So, uh, this Wednesday, starting today, we start our sermon series on the Chosen Season 4. Finally, the long-awaited yeah. Season 4 from last March, <laughs> when it was supposed to be here. Um, so, we have that coming out. Um, and starting this September, then we start the deep dives. We get to watch the, each episode then uh, on Wednesday nights. And so looking forward to that. Um, I, oh, darn it. I knew I was going to do something. Uh, I've got a box of study guides in the back office in there. I'll bring them out afterwards and put them out here for you guys. So I got some study guides for us. <laughs> They've been in the box since February. So I bought them in February to pre-order them so that I had the, the movie and everything and I had the study guides and ready to go for March. And so they've been sitting in a box since then. So um, our next men's breakfast, we're looking forward to that. And kicking around a couple of different things right now that we might have that we were talking about. Furtadas is one. And the other one is maybe going to be like a, a gratin potato casserole with some mixture of sausage gravy and stuff and cheese and baked. And yeah. And? And? Oh, yeah, and uh, possibly some ham in it as well. <laughs> uh, oh, you wanted the other, those three little words, yes. biscuits and gravy. I couldn't help but post that up this week, too, just for you. I wanted to see what you were going to say. So uh, We look forward to that October 5th at 9 a.m. in the morning. And then we uh, jump over to the October 12th, and we're going to have Orange Track racing again. We had Orange Track in here yesterday. It was a fun time. A little bit light crowd because they had everything and its brother going on for the kids this weekend. Tournaments, uh, you, you name it, sporting tournaments. I think they said there were six different sporting tournaments going on this weekend um, but we still had some good racing going on we're still all looking forward to to making that blue track fit on there and get that so i took a strip of blue track and brought it out and we ran a few cars on it yesterday kind of doing some testing and everything 
really looking forward to that. I think it'll be a really great time. And then, and then, showing sometime this November. So we gotta come up with a date yet. Uh, this November, we're gonna show the Nativity movie. And the Nativity movie is done from the perspective of Mary. And so it's, it's really well done. Um, and it's that, uh, in the narrative it here, it says, it is a story of profound faith, revered by much of humanity. One woman struggles with the destiny for which she is chosen to give birth to the Son of God and to become the object of salvation for billions of souls. So it's a, it's a very well done movie, uh, and I think we're gonna really, really enjoy it. Not sure if we're gonna need the Kleenex crew to you know spread out Kleenexes for this one or not. Uh, it'll be left to be seen, I guess, on that one there. But we're looking forward to that sometime, the mystery date in November. So we just have to figure out which date we're gonna do that on. Um, our normal movie date is also my son's birthday, so I'm not sure if that would go over well or not. Um, I could always have him come here and celebrate his birthday with us, but we'll come up with a date, so one way or the other. And today's worship then, well, all of our messages and music, we're going to post the link up for you guys online. For those of us here, hey, we get to witness it in person, so that's even better. So. Um, but we thank you for being with us here today, whether you're online or in person. And uh, we ask a blessing on those who are not able to be with us today. We had some uh, people that have gone through some procedures and hopefully everything's coming along fine for them as well. But let's start our type of worship off with a word of prayer, this, should we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful, awesome weather that you've given us here for the last uh, couple of weeks and for the blessings that it brings to us. It gives us a time of refreshment and relaxation. We can actually get some things done outside uh, and we can spend time with family and friends and, and fellowship together. So it's a time of refreshment for us as well. And we thank you for giving us that period of time. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here together freely and openly to worship you here this morning to bring your blessing out in word and in song for others to hear. And it's a message that we need to have put upon our hearts. And we thank you for the message that you good Pastor Terry to share with us here this morning as we start this series on The Chosen. And uh, we thank you for actually bringing The Chosen to those people who work so hard, so diligently to put this together for us so that we can see your word come to life and so that we can understand it more fully and take it in and live it out each and every day. Lord, we ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry as he gives his message here this morning. And uh, we just ask that you would open our ears to hear and our hearts to accept that message which you have for us today. And we pray all these things in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Pastor Terry is chosen for our call to worship this morning. Malachi 4, 5, and 6. And this comes from the NIV translations. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Wow! How would you like to have that for your morning devotional? Is that the way to start the day or what? Well, see, in Malachi, when we take a look at this and we... We, if we drop back and we go from 1 through 6 here then, and we take a look at this whole passage of, of Malachi in here, uh, it, it is talking about the coming of Christ being foretold, and the Old Testament then closes up with this chapter of expectation, what we can expect to come. And he gives us a little bit of foretaste of what was to come. And the Christians play on the English word of son of righteousness, S-U-N of righteousness, which equals the son of righteousness. In other words, the son of God is coming to us, which equals then Jesus Christ. The light of the world, Christians are those who know that true light and is now shining in the darkness that cannot be put up. So if we go back for... Let's get back a couple of verses in here 
and we take a look at the whole picture, then this really, really comes to play. So God has elected us to bring complete justice to pass only on that day of the Lord, when he will judge all the wickedness and destroy wickedness. And this is what this verse in here, this is what these are alluding to. So when he says he's going to uh, hit it with total destruction, he's going to destroy all the evil in the world. And that's something that we can actually look forward to with expectation. And this is that time of judgment and the tribulation uh, that precedes the premillennial period then of those golden years, of the thousand years. And so I thought all this really tied together very well. So thank you, Pastor Terry. Um, so in that day then, it will be for the faithful a day of blessing. Because here, here he is coming to wipe out the evil of the world, but those who are faithful to him, who know Christ, then they are spared all of the evil that is coming, that is in the world today. Uh, so it's going to be a day of blessing. In it, God will ultimately show that he rules the entire world. And this is a day, the foretelling of the last days of things today, the day of the Lord. That is what this is talking about. So in the Old Testament, it was called the day of the Lord. When the day of the Lord comes, that is the day of reckoning. And that's what they're talking about here. Uh, it's a prophetic hope of a future day that the Lord involved both expectation of a divine overthrow of evildoers and a vindication rewarding them those who were faithful and righteous. So again, it's a time of expectation for us to understand that we're going to be vindicated for all of those who did evil against us in the name of Christ. Then he will vindicate that on this day. Uh, so sometimes it's going to be one, sometimes it's going to be the other. So you're going to have evildoers put away, and sometimes it's going to be a vindication. But both are given on that day, on that day when the day of the Lord comes. The fire of judgment will fall on the arrogant and the evildoers for their destruction. Those who hold to God's name and reverence, however, will find that to be a day at a time of healing and of victory and rejoicing. The main point is that both aspects of that day are going to be accomplished when Jesus himself comes back again. The day of the Lord's reckoning. That's what that means. Amen? Amen. Is that something to look forward to? Amen. With expectation? Yes. Amen. So this closed out. This was the last chapter of the Old Testament and a foretelling of what was to come. So in God's plan, as he gave the prophecies to the prophets in here, if you notice, it is something to say, you know, be patient. My time is coming. And this is what he's talking about. And that's why I, wonder, what I, I thought it was perfect, because when I was listening to that message from David Jeremiah this morning, it was exactly what was being told him. So he was talking about the minor prophets of the Old Testament, and what they were foretelling in Obadiah, and in Malachi, and of what was to come, and, and this is exactly it. And so I thought that tied in just, God's good. What can I say? God's good. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just uh, ask a blessing on the message that is being given here this morning. Of all of the promises that you have foretold to us um, before time began, and you had a plan in place, and you reveal these things as we have our faith in you. And we praise you and thank you for that revelation that you bring onto our hearts to understand the words that you have given to these prophets six, seven, eight hundred years before the birth of Christ. So we thank you in all these things. We thank you for the message that Pastor Terry is going to give us. And we ask a special blessing on him as he gives it to us today. In the name of God we pray. Amen. 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 Got a sugar contact high walking by the temptation trail this morning. Well, good morning, church. Good well, morning. <laughs> if you're wondering, this is actually a photo of the Jordan River. 
It was the most peaceful, calming picture I could find that didn't have metal gates in it where they were taking in people who get baptized today. I wanted a, just a purely wilderness view of it. So that's what we have this morning. Well, this morning's message is called Promises. It is uh, right out of the very first episode of the fourth season. And I got, you know, the first page written and I put promises at the top. And the first thing in my head was a song from 1983. I always go to music. And it, it, if you listen to 80s music, if you're old enough to have done that, or if you're young enough and you like 80s music, you may have heard a song that says promises, promises. The entire premise of that song, though, was about one person trusting another only to find out that the other person had no intention of keeping their promise. It's a very sad song. I never really paid attention to the lyrics that closely, but when I, that lyric started popping in my head, I had to go out and check out the lyrics. When we don't keep our promises, we always seem to have a reason. Kind of goes hand in hand with uh, today, people just don't like to take responsibility for their own actions. So there's always a reason. It might be their own apathy. So then they have to make up a reason. It might be forgetfulness or just plain deceit. Here's the beauty of the message in this book. God has never made a promise that he hasn't kept. In this morning's call to worship, we began with the final two verses of the Old Testament, as Mark told us. These two verses came with the promise that God would send a prophet before the Lord returns. John would fulfill the words of Malachi 4, 5, and 6 through the promise of his birth. And this is what Mark read from Malachi 4, 5, and 6. It says, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. No, we're not going to put that on the window. <laughs> That's not it. But there is a message. If you don't know the scriptures, if you're not reading the Bible, if you're not learning the, the message that the Bible has for you, that last part, I will come and strike the land with total destruction, sounds really like you know, God is mean. That's, you know, these are the type of things that people who have no idea what God is, who God is, what he's about, what he is doing, they look at that and they say, yeah, no, he's just a bad guy. And we're going to find out a little bit more of what that looks like today. See, in Malachi, he lived 400 years before the beginning of the New Testament. The Jews have returned from the Babylonian exile. The temple has been rebuilt, albeit not to its original splendor. But things are still not as they should be. The Israelites are still under the rule of a foreign empire, and it stays that way for hundreds of years. Hundreds and hundreds of years. Long past, I mean, when we get to where Jesus is here, even then and beyond, it, isn't, it wasn't until last, well, this sounds odd now, but it wasn't until last century, which for me that wasn't that all that long ago, that Israel gained its independence, 1948. So not just hundreds of years, but you know, a couple thousand years. The book of Malachi ends with the promise of God making things right. If, I, if we jump back a chapter to Malachi 4.1, the very first part of that verse, it says, surely the day is coming. Then, silence. And I know most of you probably didn't hear that, but you can see it on the screen. Silence. 
how many times have you asked yourself, well, God, are you, do you hear me? Why can't I hear you? God's always got his timing and his purpose. But for 400 years, there is silence as the people wait to be delivered from being oppressed. It's been nearly 2,000 years and, well, we still continue to wait to be delivered. Mark was talking about the message that he heard from Dr. Jeremiah this morning that every day we're potentially one day away from seven years to the millennium. Every day we're getting one day closer. So what did the mean, John the Baptist coming mean? In Luke 1, Zechariah is told that he will have a son and he's given our next promise, his name. The, we're going to get into why they named John that here in just a moment, but Zechariah is in the sanctuary and he is praying. And we don't know what he prayed for, but I've got to imagine he prayed for, he was praying for one or two things or both. One was a son, because, you know, he and Elizabeth were in their old age and had no kids yet, and two deliverance. Let's look at Luke 1, 11 and 17. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid. How many times have we heard that in the scriptures? Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Don't be afraid, Mary. Don't be afraid, Joseph. It goes on and says, God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. And we find out in, in uh, another couple verses that it's the angel Gabriel that the Lord sent to Zechariah. It's usually either Gabriel or Michael. Those are the only two angels that are called out by name that visit. And he's told that because he's there, that because the Lord heard his prayer. And he not only announced that he would have a son, but that his name would be John, and that he would be the fulfillment of Malachi 3, 1, and 4, 5, and 6, where Malachi 1 is, 3.1, it says, Look, I'm sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you look for so eagerly, is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. God had a special plan for John. He would also, he'd be filled with the Holy Spirit before he was born. Now we've heard some in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit filled someone. This is our first occurrence where we hear that he will be filled, and not just filled with the Holy Spirit after his birth, but before his birth. That has to explain why he, and we can only know this from Elizabeth, he leapt for joy when Mary arrived because she was carrying our Lord. Now, I, I wonder, I've always wondered this, and because he and his wife Elizabeth were older, I wonder if they thought about the promise that the Lord had made to Abraham. Remember Abraham and Sarah were older too. I wonder what parallels were going through his mind at the time. The birth of a child at, that, at their age would certainly be a miracle. So John's life begins with the miracle of birth. 
He would go on to fulfill the special role that God had for him, the one that was prophesied so many years before by Malachi and certainly Isaiah. The promise made to Zechariah was that his son would be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. John's role would be much like Elijah's in that he would encourage people to turn away from their sin and back to God. And by teaching what is right, John would bring peace to parents and their children. He would also be like Elijah and standing up to the rulers of his time and letting them know that what they were doing was wrong, evil or even both. We'll get to that in a little bit in the parent. Like John, God knew us before we were born, so he knows us better than anyone else. And there's another promise here as well, and that is that God created each of us for a special purpose. And it goes beyond just those of us sitting here watching online and other churches sitting in pews or chairs listening to a message, professing to be Christian. It goes to all the world. Those that don't even believe in God, God still created them with a purpose. Well, let's fast forward a few months because when Mary arrived, Elizabeth was what, about five, six months pregnant? So we still have a little bit to go. And that takes us to Luke 1, 57 and 64. When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been very merciful to her, everyone rejoiced with her. When the baby was eight years old, or eight years, eight days old, that was a little difference in time frame, they all came for the circumcision ceremony. They wanted to name him Zechariah after his father. But Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. What? They exclaimed. There is no one in all your family by that name. So they used gestures to ask the baby's father what he wanted to name him. He motioned for a writing tablet, and to everyone's surprise, he wrote, His name is John. Instantly, Zechariah could speak again, and he began praising God. What a joyous occasion for the family. Much like how our family and friends would come to a baptism. It's been a few, a couple of years now since our last baptism, but that was our family and I, they just kind of filled up up here. They came to celebrate that. And together they celebrated the baby becoming part of God's covenant. Family lines and subsequently family names were very important to the Jewish people. So it would be no surprise that they all thought that the baby's name would be Zechariah or maybe at the very least a family name of some sort. But they had to have been very surprised when Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. Of course, we all know how the women were looked upon in that time. So immediately they just kind of discounted what she said and went right to Zechariah. And he grabbed that tablet and he wrote it out, his name is John. And that broke that period of silence that he had for nine. Can you imagine nine months without saying a word? Then it's going, I can't even get a day without it being quiet. <laughs> But he praised God for the miracle of John's birth. Unfortunately, we don't know much, if anything, about John's youth. But I would imagine it was spent with God preparing him to fulfill his purpose. What we do know is something that Luke wrote at the very end of Luke chapter 1, verse 80. A long chapter. But he wrote, John grew up and became strong in spirit. And he lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. So really now we have a 24 year or so gap when he appears in the wilderness. That gets us to our next promise. That is his mission. In Mark 1, 1 and 8 it says, This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. 
It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. I love this next part. All of Judea, including the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven with coarse camel hair and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. And John announced, Someone is coming who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John's mission? And my mind wonders when I'm writing these things. I immediately, immediately go to the old Mission Impossible TV show. Your mission, if you choose to success. <laughs> yeah. He chose to accept it. He accepted his mission wholeheartedly. The thing about his mission is it was not for the faint of heart. John was announcing the coming of the Son of God. Jesus was the promised king of the Old Testament prophecies, the descendant of King David who would deliver his people and rule his kingdom. In stating that John is preparing the way for the Son of God, Mark is also letting us know that Jesus is more than a mere human being, but that he is also fully divine. In ancient times, it was typical for a king to send an envoy ahead of him to announce his arrival and to prepare things for him. So, this all makes sense. But it wasn't just Malachi that prophesied John's mission. Isaiah did this as well. And as God does, this was actually part of my morning devotional reading this morning. From Isaiah 40, verse 3, it says, Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Through his message, John was getting people to honestly and wholeheartedly repent of their sins. It wasn't like this surface level. They were getting in there and they were truly repenting of their sins. And they were moving from looking at life from an earthly perspective to a heavenly one. John's baptism prepared the people to receive the message that Jesus was going to bring. This was the beginning of the spiritual process. That John lived such a humble life, eating locusts and wild honey. I can go with the honey, the locusts. The way he dressed. These things separated him from the religious leaders of the time. Because, remember, they all had their ornate flowing robes and they had different outfits for different occasions and this whole pomp and circumstance. There's a reason that we don't wear robes and we don't have all that garb because we're humans too. We want to be a humble spirit like John. In living this way, he showed others that he was unworthy. And he was pointing to someone who was so much powerful than he or anyone else was. His statement in verse 8 that he was baptizing with water, but that one coming, the Messiah, would baptize him with the Holy Spirit was the fulfillment of Joel 2.28, where it says, Then, after doing all these things, I will pour out my Spirit upon all people. Is by the Holy Spirit that we are transformed. Jesus offers us the forgiveness of our sins and the power to live with him. Jesus would go out to John to be baptized. Now, if I'm John and I'm by the river here and I see Jesus coming, I mean, remember he left in 
mom's womb when he, before he was born. If he was very athletic, I could see him doing like a backflip or something, just really super excited, jumping up and down. Look, it's the Lord. He was probably thinking, boy, here comes Jesus. He's going to baptize me. He wasn't aware of what Jesus was coming there for. He was not aware that he, Jesus was coming to be baptized which is leading us right into our next point, which is he consented. So let's pick this up from Matthew 3, verse 13 and 17, where it says, Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. And that's all that John needed. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and setting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. I don't know about you all, but there's been more than a few times in my life that I have felt woefully unqualified to do something, fill in the blank with whatever it is. John most certainly felt unqualified, believing that it was himself that would be baptized by Jesus, not the other way around. So why did Jesus ask to be baptized? It wasn't because he needed to repent of any sin. He had lived a sinless life. He had nothing to repent. It had to be done for the very reason that Jesus said, to carry out all that God required. Jesus saw his baptism as advancing the work of God. So we can look at Jesus being baptized for these reasons. He was confessing sin on behalf of Israel. Not for himself, but on behalf of Israel. Because he, if he's going to take on the sins of the people, he's confessing it on behalf of the people. He's supporting John's work. He's also beginning his public ministry. And it allowed him to identify with the people of God who had repented of their own sins and not the religious leaders that separated him. He accepted it in obedience to God who showed his approval. John would ultimately consent and in doing so would release the power of the Holy Spirit over Jesus' life. Remember what it said? The Spirit came down like a dove and settled upon him. But here's an interesting part. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't see it. The Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible anywhere. Well, they're all together here. Jesus is getting baptized. The Holy Spirit is descending upon him so he can begin his earthly ministry. And God said, that's my boy. I'm proud of him. Actually, it was, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. But, you know, They were there, God, the Holy Spirit, were there with Jesus, and they, it's like they were putting the rubber stamp. They were endorsing Jesus' earthly mission. Notice how all the things that John has done up to this point lead to the fulfillment of our final promise for today. He prepared the way. Everything that John did was to prepare the way for the Messiah, for Jesus. And Jesus confirms John's mission later in Matthew, if we take a look at verse, or chapter 11, verses 7 and 15. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began talking about him to the crowds. Now, this is when John is in jail. Herod's got him in jail. He's probably malnourished. Probably doesn't get much exercise, let alone any kind of sunlight. So he's probably kind of wasting away a little bit. And 
then you start playing with your mind in seclusion. And he had started to doubt what he knew. So he sent his disciples to Jesus to say, are you truly the Messiah? Are you the one that was sent to deliver the people? And of course, Jesus had said, you've seen the sick healed, the blind see, all these things that he has done. So this is right after the disciples are going back to John. And Jesus says, what kind of man did you go into the wilderness to see? Was he a weak reed, swayed by every breath of wind? Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No, people with expensive clothes live in palaces. Were you looking for a prophet? Yes, and he is more than a prophet. John is the man to whom the scriptures refer when they say, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you and he will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist, yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. And from the time John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and violent people are attacking it. For before John came, all the prophets and all the law of Moses looked forward to this present time. And if you are willing to accept what I say, he is Elijah, the one the prophets said would come. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. It could be said, based on what Jesus has told us, that no other person had fulfilled their God-given purpose better than John had. But what does it mean when Jesus said the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater? If John was so wonderful, why this contra seeming contradiction? It's not. See, in God's kingdom, people are already there. His people hold a higher status than anyone who is considered great in the world. And John is still in the world. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven itself. So we got to remember that Jesus is looking and speaking about these things from God's point of view, not ours. To enter into God's kingdom, it takes courage. Well, John had that. It takes unwavering faith. John definitely had that. And it takes determination. And I would say even maybe some stubbornness. Because John, he was kind of stubborn. As time goes on, and opposition to Jesus grew and continues to grow to this day, I would say it also takes endurance. It's not a sprint. Life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And we have to prepare ourselves for that. In verse 14, Jesus says that John is Elijah. John wasn't Elijah resurrected, but he did pick up the mantle by boldly confronting sin and pointing people back to God. Jesus pointed out that since John had been preaching the kingdom of heaven, that the kingdom of heaven had been moving forward. John didn't let things deter him or stop him. He continued right doing what he was doing right while he was in prison. And while John's life was cut short when Herod had him beheaded, his influence continued through that time and even to today because it was him who heralded in the kingdom of heaven. He prepared the way for Jesus. He didn't let anything get in the way and he always kept his heart focused on the Messiah. And with y'all know better than anyone else for yourself, there's so many distractions from God. We've got these little gadgets, got computers like we have in the back, 
Just step outside and talk to somebody. There's a distraction of some sort, somewhere, somehow. And we have to remember to be like John and keep our focus on Christ. John provided us an example of what it looks like to be faithful and obedient to God regardless of the circumstances that we are in. Now, when we go to watch the episode on Wednesday, you'll get a little bit more of all of this, including a whole section on Herod and his, his ultimately his death. But may we be so bold to live a life proclaiming truth, remaining faithful and obedient to God regardless of the circumstances that we are in. Gracious Father, we just thank you that you sent us prophets that would try and help guide and steer your people. We thank you for Isaiah, for Malachi, for prophesying about the coming messenger who would announce Christ's arrival. In my mind's eye, Lord, I can see Jesus as he returns coming in out of the clouds with his army, your army. But I also know that it will happen in your time. And while there might be periods of silence, there may be circumstances that try to pull us away from you. The enemy may put doubt in our mind as to whether we're truly fulfilling our calling. Whether that calling is preaching and teaching your word or just loving on our neighbors and our co-workers in the way that Jesus would so that they can learn and want to know the hope that we have. Thank you for always fulfilling your promise, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry, for that message. We have hope and we have something to look forward to. Those of us who are faithful and are a part of the kingdom of God, what did that passage tell us? That we are of the kingdom of God are greater than John the Baptist. And what did Jesus say? As he sent his disciples out that we will go into the, to the world and he will give us his power and his strength to do things even greater than he did promises for us as we enter into the kingdom of God we still got work to do we got work to do before we get there but we're still going to have work to do after but can you imagine what a wonderful world it's going to be and what a wonderful work it is to be able to be able to do that so we have promises and, and yes all these things came to pass and, and uh, John was beheaded. You can't really look forward to that. But you know he is standing there with God. Because he fulfilled the work of God here. And God's promise stands still stands true that he will join him in paradise. That's the same promise he has for us today. As we come into this time of, of communion this morning, I want you to kind of hold on to that the promises of God that he has for us. That our work has yet to be done. We still have things to do before that day comes. And that day can come anytime. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. Later in the meal, he took the cup and after he had filled it, he blessed it. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you. 
and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink. In doing that, we participate with Jesus in his sacrifice and in his suffering. We participate then with him in that resurrection and that salvation. That is how we participate in that salvation. It's through the breaking of his bread. Partaking of that bread. The drinking of the cup. Partaking in the washing of the clean. Our salvation through him and through his sacrifice. And that's what causes us. And that's why he wants us to remember this. Because that is his promise to us. Through the partaking of this communion. A gathering together as he gathered together with the disciples. Communion. In communion with one another. To participate in that salvation act. The body of Jesus broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Jesus shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. prayers for the people. So if there's any prayers that you'd like, we have quite a few to pray for that have had surgeries this week. There's four of them. So, okay, well, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we come into your house this morning to worship and honor you with praise and thanksgiving. Let the Holy Spirit rest among us. As it states in Psalms 144-2, he is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer. My shield in whom I take refuge. Psalms 91.4 He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Psalms 91.1 and 2 He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Father God, help us to be a people that will trust in you for all things, great and small. For you, O oh God, are in the details of our lives. Our bodies are not hidden from you, for you formed us in the secret place. You know when we lie down, you know when we rise, you perceive our thoughts from afar. There is nowhere that we can hide from your presence. You are faithful, so help us to be faithful servants to a living God. Father God, we lift up Chloe, for she had a tonsillectomy surgery on Friday. God, we lift up Lynette to you, for she had surgery on her left foot Thursday. We lift up Jessica Montgomery for emergency surgery on her gallbladder Tuesday. And Father God, we lift up Rich Huyton's wife for breast cancer surgery Monday. We pray for your healing, your healing power. May the Holy Spirit rest upon all of those that have had surgery to comfort them through the pain. May the blood of Jesus that was poured out wash them and cleanse them from any infections. May your bodies heal quickly in the mighty name of Jesus. And may you praise God for what he is doing in your life and how he is taking care of your every need. I lift up all who have cancer, mental illness, or COVID or broken bones. I pray for healing and comfort, people to help you through the trials you are in. Psalms 23, 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals, will hem them in on all sides to guide you through to restoration. For he is our mighty God who saves us from the evil one, who comes to seek, kill, and destroy our bodies. But God is our refuge, the God in whom we trust. Father God, we lift up our children and grandchildren to you. If there is any evil way in them, if their hearts are like stone, I pray you will guide them on the path to righteousness and replace their hearts of stone with a heart for you, O oh God, a oh, <clears throat> heart of compassion and willingness to learn your decrees. Help them to learn and follow your Ten Commandments so that you will be with them when the days of trouble come. To our homeless, or for our homeless population, Lord, 
We ask for a willingness of heart to move and act to help themselves up and out of their current situations. Bring people that can guide them along and bring good news to them. Give them hope for each new day. And Father God, our world is in desperate trouble that only you can fix. We ask, Father, that you open the eyes of all in America, that people would ask for your guidance in the upcoming election before they vote. Help us to see and vote according to your will for America, that we may have peace in our land for another four years. For you alone are God, and you alone have the power to save our country, or let it be destroyed. You let, let your will be done in this land of the free and the home of the brave, as we call ourselves. Please forgive us of our transgressions and bring us back to you, almighty God. In Jesus' mighty name and precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise be to God. We talked about going out and being bold and not being afraid. Yesterday I got here uh, to get ready to finish up a couple of little minor details for Orange Track and one of our neighbors across the way had arrived to get something going at her place of business. Now, for a little background, she and I are a little bit on different sides of the spectrum on our political beliefs and some of our religious beliefs. She believes in God, she believes in Jesus. But I've seen her getting attacked by people online. And she's a friend from work. I've known her for 12 years now. Um, she doesn't work there anymore, but God kept going, come on. <laughs> you ever watch the uh, person trying to walk their dog or the dog trying to walk their human? <laughs> or it's like they're yeah. pulling, it's like God was pulling me in. And I saw her come out of the building and so I walked out across the way with my coffee and I had a conversation with her. I said, you know, I've seen how people treat you. I've seen people attack you for your beliefs and, and for some of the things that uh, you believe in. I said as a Christian, not as a pastor, but as a Christian, someone who truly believes that Christ is my Lord and Savior, I'm sorry. Because that is not how a Christian treats another human being. We should be speaking truth in love. Not in dripping with venom. And then Mark, in your, as we were doing communion, he said, standing on the promise of God. Right. And so first thing in my mind, and I'm not a big hymn guy, but the first thing in my head was standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let his praises reign. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Ouch. Wow. I just had, I got chills thinking about it. And so whatever was in my mind before to come up here and say as we close out this part of our service is, is gone. But God makes promises. And he keeps promises. I have yet to, he's promised to send Jesus again. Based on his other promises, I know he is going to do what he said. We used to have, we used to say it uh, somewhere that I worked. You know, past performance predicts future performance. God's past performance is that He honors His promises. So in the future, He, I know, He will honor His promises. Let us be bold in our faith. Father God, thank you once again for the promise that we have for the hope that we have, knowing that Jesus will return in your time, 
and in your way. In the meantime, Father, give us the endurance, the courage, the faith to be obedient to your call on our life, no matter the circumstances that we're in. As we leave this place, Lord, let us not forget the message that you had for each one of us, Father, because that message, the message that you had for me as I'm writing this is probably meant very different from the message that someone else heard. But it's the message that you had for me, and it's the message that you have for them. Thank you that you were able to work in that way, Father. In Jesus' mighty name.